Thanks, Peter, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at AnacondaCon, even if it's just virtually by means of a video recording. I'm Alex Smola, VP and Distinguished Scientist at AWS AI, and I wanted to tell you a little bit what we're doing in Amazon in terms of open source for machine learning. So if you look at machine learning overall, well, actually, machine learning is really becoming the spice that makes all the related services products really successful. For instance, for healthcare, personalization, personalized recommendations clearly improve the outcome. With self-driving cars, if they're not intelligent, well, you probably wouldn't want to get into one of them. Likewise, robotics, manufacturing, transcribing texts from speech to text, or then translating them. In all of those cases, you clearly do need machine learning in order to be successful. In short, machine learning is really becoming the centerpiece and the key ingredient for a lot of successful and exciting services. Now, that's not just us, but as a matter of fact, tens of thousands of customers on AWS have chosen uh, to run their machine learning workloads on AWS. So that's more than twice as many customers as any other cloud provider. So below there, there's a smattering of logos for companies. So for instance, Pinterest uses AWS to help them analyze and assess the images. Obviously, you can imagine that Tinder might want to do something similar, but then there are also universities such as Caltech and Carnegie Mellon University who run their machine learning workloads on AWS. So we have a wide range of customers who trust us with their data, with their problems in order to succeed. Now, our goal is to bring Amazon's machine learning innovation to our customers, be that in product recommendation and personalization, in logistics, in question answering and dialogue, or in autonomous systems to deliver a product. In short, our mission at AWS is to put machine learning into the hands of every developer and every scientist. Now, that's a simple statement, but it actually implies a lot because it means that we want to have the right tools, no matter whether you're at the beginning of your machine learning journey or whether you're a very seasoned scientist who's developing and inventing new algorithms and wants AWS to help them with that. So that leads to the broadest and deepest set of AI and machine learning services. So for instance, even just last year, we added 200 new features and services. That's a lot. And that means we support all the three major frameworks. We have solutions for everybody. So for instance, if you want to have just you know the bare hardware, yes, we do that. But if you want to have a more managed experience where you don't have to teach your data scientists how to set up a machine and to teach them about armies and shutting machines down and so on, you can get the entire hosted managed experience of Jupyter Notebooks from Amazon. This is called SageMaker. This is a single ID for the entire machine learning workflow from modeling to training to serving and hosting models to also ensuring that those served and hosted models work well and that they keep on working well. So this leads to a lower total cost of ownership over one half reduction, it can lead up to a 70% reduction if you want to label data, which is often the key ingredient to building any machine learning model. And if you are a little bit more patient in terms of when and how you train your models, well, then spot instances can give you up to a 90% reduction in cost relative to on demand. Now, all this machine learning is worth nothing unless it's actually embedded within a much larger ecosystem. And we have that. We've built this machine learning offering on the most comprehensive cloud platform. So whether it's databases, storage, lots of different types of compute, security, also locations, all of this is available to 
supplement and extend the ability of what you can do with just machine learning. So it's no surprise that 85% of all the TensorFlow workloads in the cloud run on AWS. Okay. So what I've been just talking about is this three layer stack. At the very top are AI services. So those services are there if you just want to have your cat recognized and Amazon recognition will happily do that for you no real machine learning required. Or if you want to translate text from one language to another, well, you can do that or recognize speech or te turn text into speech or even build a dialogue system or a personalization system. All of those things work nicely within the AWS AI stack. And you don't really need to be a, a big expert in building machine learning models. So we did all the hard work for you so you can focus on what makes your company great. Now, if you want to unpack things a little bit further and dive down, well, there's Amazon SageMaker. And SageMaker offers, as I mentioned, a managed experience for how to combine notebooks, built-in first-party algorithms, how to then manage the experiments, how to serve them, how to make sure that they always work well, all of those things are available from within a managed service. Now this sits on the foundation of a variety of deep learning frameworks, such as TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch, a bunch of libraries on top of that, such as Hotovod, Deep Graph Library, Keras, Scikit-Learn, and Gluon. And then, of course, if you want to dive down to the very nitty gritty, well, we also have accelerated chips available, such as Inferentia, or if you think that your problem is so specific that you want to program your own FPGAs, you can do that too. Now, the big star of the show quite often is what's in the lower left, namely open source software used by Amazon, but also made by Amazon. Now, open source is something where you have a community. It's an ecosystem. And this ecosystem thrives by give and take. So that means that it's incumbent upon us as good citizens in the open source community to contribute libraries. But also, of course, it means that we use tools that everybody else uses and loves, such as Conda, such as Jupyter, in order to, well, enrich and extend and strengthen our own products. Now, below that, on the, the screen, you see a smattering of acronyms, and you may or may not have seen them before, and I'll walk you through that in a moment. But what we really do is we have this open source ecosystem that AWS is excited about being a part of because they enrich and strengthen our services. We contribute to that ecosystem such that we can grow the entire community. This is also why I'm really excited about AnacondaCon because this is a gathering of makers, of builders, of users of open source. And lastly, of course, we want to communicate and engage in a dialogue with the research community. And quite often, it makes a big difference whether you can say, well, okay, here's this network architecture or Here's this network architecture. By the way, here's the code. Please check it out. So some of the things that we offer is, for instance, a TVM compiler. So this is a compiler for deep networks. DGL is a deep learning framework for graphs. We use Jupyter Notebooks extensively, and we also contribute back. So for instance, Brian Granger, one of the co-founders of the Jupyter project, is in Amazon. We offer tools for time series prediction. There's a deep learning framework called MXNet that we support. And then, of course, unless you actually teach people how to do deep learning, well, they're probably not going to use it. So we decided, well, we should probably write a book on that. And that's D2L. Then there's Autogluon, which means if you don't necessarily want to spend too much time on building your own machine learning system and just Build some, use something automatically, AutoML through AutoGluon can do that. 
And lastly, there are libraries for computer vision through Gluon CV and natural language processing through Gluon NLP. Now that's a lot and I only have 30 minutes. So we'll focus on four things, namely the graphs, the book, RTML and computer vision in this talk. Let's start with graphs. So let's think about what a graph is. So here's an example of a food web. So it's basically who eats whom. So the leopard seals, maybe they well, seem to be eating penguins. I didn't realize that they also maybe eat some other birds, but basically maybe the penguins then eat some crabs and they again eat phytoplankton and so on. So you have this interconnected network. And you might want to do things like regression on the edge as to you know how maybe the zooplankton affects the other seals. Or on a regression on the vertex, you might want to make some statements about you know maybe the lean whales, or maybe you have a set of additional resources about elephant seals, maybe you know their habitat, the location, whatever, and you want to combine this with that food web into a more meaningful joint embedding. So for the baleen whales, you might want to infer is it an endangered species? For zooplankton to other seals, maybe you want to find out whether the pesticides are being transferred and thus affect the seals. And as said for the elephant seals, well, maybe it's other facts that you might know about them. So this sounds all really great and you can hand engineer things, or you can just say, well, here's the data that I have and I want to learn from the data that I have to generalize to additional data. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what DGL, the Deep Graph Library does. So the user just goes and implements the vertex and edge update functions. DGL takes care of all the gradients and optimizations for you. Now, since everybody uses a different framework, well, it supports multiple of them, namely PyTorch, TensorFlow, and MXNet. It's quite efficient. So if you compare PyGeometric and DGL, well, we are faster quite a bit. So lower is better on the curve on the right. Not only is it faster, it also supports a wide range of domain specific toolkits, for instance, for life sciences, less about the food webs, but more about computational biology and knowledge graphs to combine different data sources. It's all open source, of course, as always. So if you go to dgl.ai, you'll see how to find it. Now, I mentioned knowledge graphs a little bit, and in the time of COVID-19, this is particularly pertinent because you might have a lot of different papers that are being published. So there's, for instance, a COVID-19 data set, but then people didn't start biology only in January. There's a lot of additional knowledge out there. For instance, you know, Hetionet, GNDB, or uh, Drugnet and so on. And all of those data sources, you want to be able to combine them. So a couple of algorithms that help you do that. For instance, Rescal, Complex, TransR and so on. And so what we did is we went and implemented them. So they sit on top of the DGL knowledge embedding runtime, which then uses DGL graph, the samplers and the KV store. And then the backend is PyTorch, MXNet and so on, which then runs on GPUs, CPUs, or an entire cluster. So is it fast? Yes, it's considerably faster than PyTorch Big Graph. So essentially, if you look at the picture on the left, you see that, well, you know, obviously the salmon color is, this bar is lower than this, which means it's quite a bit faster. And if you have multiple machines, you get nice parallelization as well. So this actually scales rather nice, perfectly. So you get the 4x speed up by going to four machines. As I mentioned before, you might want to train this on data for COVID-19 in order to, for instance, get ideas for new drug targets. And if you're interested in this, we've made everything available, both the code and also the trained weights. So that's about 100,000 entities, about 6 million edges. And if you go to gnn 4 dr DRKG, so whoever picked that name decided that well, lots of consonants are great, but basically if you go to that URL, you can get 
all the data and well knowledge graphs for COVID-19. Uh, and if you then maybe besides those six knowledge graphs, find a, a, you know, a seventh one a data source that you might want to add, feel free to do so. And since it's open source, we'd appreciate if you could contribute it back. Okay. Now, besides graphs, there's also computer vision. And let me just give you a bit of an idea of what you can find. So on the right hand side, you see a pose estimator, and this is probably some busy street in the UK somewhere. And you can see that it does a fairly decent job at estimating where people are and what their pose is. Now, besides that, Gluon CV also offers algorithms for classification, detection, segmentation, pose estimation, action recognition. And yeah, in addition to that, well, you can get key point detection and depth prediction. So depth prediction means, for instance, if I show you a picture of the Eiffel Tower, I would like my network to say, well, the tip of the Eiffel Tower is probably further away than the base, right? But if you only have a 2D image, well, that's not quite that easy, right? But that's essentially what you want to be able to do in depth prediction. Now, all those things are, you know, well-known computer vision problem, but what you want to be able to do is you want them all accessible to you within the same API, within the same consistent API. So for instance, when we go and release a new model that happens to be state of the art, like ResNest, well, then you can just go and download that and you get the most accurate model that you can want. So on this graph, the X axis is how fast the network is. So it's basically samples per second. And the Y axis is the accuracy. So a good model pushes the graph to the right or up. So it's either faster for the same amount of compute or more accurate. And well, in this case, we pushed the curve up. Now, uh, of course, classification isn't the only thing you might want to detect things like you might not just want to say, if I give you a big picture with a cat and a tree and a dog to say cat, no, you want to know, here's the cat, here's the dog, here's the tree. This is what detection does. And again, we beat and established us a new state of the art. So the orange dots on the left, that's us. And that's basically ResNest with faster RCNN. And so it does fairly well. Now, if you want to have something that has a little bit higher throughput, well, you can use an old version of YOLO. And the vertical line here is quite important because that's actually the published results in the literature. That's ours. So if you want to find out how to train those networks really well, how to do this quite accurately, well, you can do that through Gluon CV. To give you a bit of an idea of what's going on behind the scenes, so this is the ResNest ImageNet backbone. Um, so the rather than a simple convolution, it goes and splits up the channels into individual subgroups. Within each of those, you have an attention mechanism. And then in the end, you combine this all again. So to zoom in a little bit further, what you get is basically for each input, you then compute a local weighting function you run this through a softmax because you need that for attention such that all the weights add up to one. You then multiply that with the appropriate inputs as you had, and this is your new output. Now, why this works is because you want to be able to transfer reasonably efficiently information as to what is relevant between different pieces of the image and also between different channels. And that's exactly what ResNest does. So it gives you the state of the art result for classification, detection, and segmentation. And by the way, you can also adapt it to other things like pose, video, and action recognition. And if you want to use it, well, you just import get model from Gluon CV model zoo, and then you call get model, and voila, there's the fully trained model. So this way, you don't have to go and start again from scratch and train a model from scratch. We've done this for you. We've tuned all the parameters. We've optimized all of that for you so you don't have to. Okay. Speaking of automation, this brings me to autogluon. So in some cases, well, you just want to get the job done and you don't want to worry that much about individual details. So AutoML 
tries to find the best model. But actually it turns out that what a lot of auto ML tools are doing is maybe not quite the right approach. They find, try to find the single best model. That would be a little bit like asking, what's the single best Chinese dish you can have? Well, it's a stupid question because a good dinner there is if you combine a variety of different dishes and you share with friends. And so it's the combination of flavors that makes it best. Turns out it's actually quite similar in machine learning. If you combine multiple models, you do a lot better. So we go and combine trees and forests and nearest neighbors and deep networks and linear models and other pieces. And if you think you have something else that you might want to throw in, please, you know, send us a pull request and we'll take that. And the combination of those models gives much higher accuracy. Now, the other cool thing is that if you actually go and stack those models on top of each other, they complement each other even further. Lastly, of course, you want to pre-process your data and you want to be reasonably smart in doing that. Okay, it sounds complicated. So we worked hard to have a really simple API. And the simple API is basically just, you import the prediction task and then you call the fit function and then afterwards on you know new test data, you call fit and that's it. Now that's great, but if you don't know how long it takes, that's not good. So we also worked hard to have reliable runtime guarantees. So we make sure that if you say, well, I want to have the best you can produce in four hours, A, we use the four hours and B, we actually produce something within four hours. Okay, all sounds great. It actually works quite well. So on the left, you see a diagram which plots the loss on the test data relative to autogluon. So this is on a log scale. And basically, if you, you know, this is, this is worth mentioning. So basically, models out here have 20 times as high error as autogluon. Models here have low error. What you see is that most of the dots are to the right. This is comparing to all the best public and commercial AutoML systems that are out there, including GCP tables, H2S AutoML, AutoWaker Teapot, AutoSKLearn. And we beat them all. I mean, I showed you the picture here for a one hour benchmark and for four hours, it would look kind of the same. And, and we thought, okay, well, that's great. So we've beat other algorithms. And as a matter of fact, it's sufficiently good that if you were to take all other AutoML systems and afterwards on the test set decide which one is best and pick that, we would still beat it. But, you know, fine, you can beat other AutoML systems, what's that? But can you beat humans? And it turns out that actually in some cases you can. So we looked at the more recent uh, data sets on Kaggle that didn't have any specific strange processing requirements that, such as, well, it's a time series, so it has significant covariate shift and whatever. And we compared our performance on those. And what we did is we didn't just compare to all the other auto ML systems. Yes, we know that we do well relative to them, but we also looked at how well we do relative to the humans. And there are two data sets where we are actually in the 99% quantile. So what that means is that 99% of all scientists and engineers who uploaded data that their models did not manage to produce as good a model as we managed to produce within four hours out of the box. So I think that's pretty good encouragement that probably if you use that, you'll get a good starting point for, well, Tableau data. Now, Tableau data isn't all. There is also hyperparameter optimization built in if you need it how to work with multiple machines, how to support multiple frameworks. And then of course, if you have pre-trained models for computer vision and NLP, you can get those two through the model zoo. So that means you download those pre-trained models and then you can just fine tune and transfer learn to your specific problem at hand. Now, the last thing that I think is quite cool is you can actually specify which pieces you want to optimize. So in many other AutoML systems, it's all or nothing. It's either, you know, you fully trust that AutoML system or you do everything by yourself. But in many cases, you have a pretty good idea of some parts of the model and you're unsure about others. And so what you can do is you can just bracket out this one piece of the model and you say, well, 
dear autogloom, please optimize that, keep the rest fixed. And that's reasonably efficiently done through decorators. And so this way you can basically just have autogloon fill in the blanks. Okay, so that's it for autogloon and please check it out on the website. But I wanted to show you something else that I'm actually quite excited about, namely our book. So yeah, okay, it's another deep learning book and yeah, sure, it covers a lot of things. It's maybe about a thousand pages by now, over 150 notebooks. And this is exactly where things differ from your generic deep learning textbook, right? Your regular deep learning textbook is just that, it's a book. But if you then actually want to go and use it, well, you need to do a search for some GitHub repo that has some models in it. Whereas in D2L, you get all of that within the same notation, within the same implementation. And so you just download your Jupyter notebooks and you run them. And if you want to modify things, then you can do that directly within that. I'm a big fan of learning by doing. And I would argue that unless you've actually modified a model, you've probably not understood how it works. Okay. It also is all open source. So if you think that we've explained something poorly and you could want to do it better, by all means, please send us a pull request and we'll happily take it and then it'll improve. Now, this is all nice talk, but let me actually show you this in action. So here's an example of a concise implementation of softmax regression using, in this case, MXNet. And so you have those code cells here, which, you know, describe, you know, how to import code and it basically, you know, just imports MXNet. Um, then you go and set your batch size. And if you were to continue down there, you'd see, you know, a little bit of explanation of why you do things. So this book has theorems and proofs and references to academic papers and all of that. But there's also enough detail that you can just go and use it. And then if you want to run it, you can run it on SageMaker or also on Colab. Now, very unsurprisingly, a lot of universities actually picked this up. By now there are over 70 universities who are teaching courses based on D2L. And this number has been growing and people generally like it a lot. But then, you know, you get those tweets. I think it uses MXNet instead of TensorFlow or PyTorch, so that's annoying. Or, well, that will be great. However, there's a GitHub repo with a PyTorch version in the form of notebook. Probably have already seen that. Um, any chance you would support PyTorch in the future? Okay, so we got a whole bunch of those requests. And at some point we thought, well, okay, maybe we should listen to our customers and actually do something about it. So I can proudly announce that as of today, you can do PyTorch. So as of today, this website that I just showed you looks like this. There's now an MXNet tab and a PyTorch tab and you can see how the code looks like in MXNet or in PyTorch. I mean, the math is still all the same, but the code is slightly different because it's a different framework. And everything that you see on the website is actually code that's run. So this is perfectly runnable, executable code that's highly reliable. And you can use that directly for your problems, maybe to solve your assignment if you are taking a class but more importantly, to solve some real problems that you might have. And yeah, now, of course, we're not entirely done yet. So far, we have about eight chapters. So that's around 50 notebooks. And there are a lot more to go. There are still about maybe 120, 130 notebooks to go. So we need your help. We need your help to complete the PyTorch port. And by the way, if you think that, well, TensorFlow or Jack should also be there, well, we'd be more than happy to have that as part of the book. Of course, if you think that, well, there's a key chapter missing, go forth, please write that, contribute to it, send us a pull request, and we would be delighted to see that. So in the future, I expect a lot more content to be there on D2L that covers also more advanced niche areas. The only thing is if you want to contribute a chapter, we will be rather forceful editors 
and ensure that the content is up to the bar, quality bar that we have, that the notation is consistent, that it's equally usable, such that ideally for a reader of the book, they would not be able to tell whether this was a contributed chapter or our own. Well, short of, of course, us saying, well, somebody else wrote it. Right. So I wanted to conclude with this big overview. So this is, again, a short summary of what Amazon does to increase and support the open source ecosystem in machine learning. And I'm really proud of this. And I'm proud that it's both a give and take where we can use great tools contributed by the community, but also give back and share back with the community because I believe that success helps everybody. A rising tide lifts all the boats. And with that, I wanted to say many, many thanks. Special thanks also to Anaconda because without Conda, we would not have been able to build the D2L book. So all the CI tools and so on use Conda quite extensively to make sure we always have a well-defined environment spun up no matter where we run it. So many thanks to Peter for being so gracious to work and build and invent this and actually not just Peter, but the entire community. So thanks a lot for having me here. Goodbye and stay safe.